Um, sometimes I listen to atheists just it's kind of one of my things <laughs> sometimes I I watch debates between high-level atheists and theists, or I read books written by atheists, um, listen to them philosophize. Not your average foolish atheist, but you know, well-read, philosophically astute atheists. Um, part of the reason why is because they are my natural born enemies and so it would be like just if you had somebody that you knew you were going to fight then you would watch what they do and listen to them so that you had counters for all of their moves that's probably the most straightforward reason why I, I study atheists atheistic philosophers and then I don't just want to be able to defeat the low-level atheists, the garden variety ones you meet at you know, a gas station or something like that, I want to be able to get in the ring with professional atheists, high-level atheists, and, and, uh, and interact with them and, and persuade them or prevail to the people who are sitting around when I talk to them. So I, I think that's the most straightforward reason why I study atheism. Um, at a certain time in my life, I studied atheism to quell my own doubts about the existence of God. But that was a long time ago. Um, and so that's, that's no longer the case. But I still continue to read them, and that's so I can interact with them and, and, uh, and prevail. Um, I think for... A devotee, then atheism is an, are the antithesis of our philosophical position. Now, you cannot care about somebody. You know, you can just ignore them, pretend they don't exist, and so you can punish their non agreement with you. ignoring someone and not caring about somebody or becoming totally apathetic towards them. Um, and so I, I think there's value in that, sure. But if you are a devotee, then naturally...
something like that and, and and then there were people who had some crazy idea that the cure for cancer you shouldn't take it and they were dying of cancer all around you and, and you had to convince them to take the cure not only did you have to get the cure But then you had to convince them to take it. They were embracing their pain as the medicine. But, and they, they weren't taking the actual medicine. And so then part of your job as a, as a medic, part of your job as a doctor was to convince people that they should take the medicine and then give them the medicine. Um, and so with that little thought experiment, you can understand why a devotee naturally would need to engage with atheism even if it wasn't your thing even if you'd gotten over it yourself other people haven't gotten over it and so a big chunk of your job is contending with people who haven't gotten over it and it's not just for priests professional priests and watch debates between theists and atheists. I buy books by atheists. And initially, when I was young, It was as part of discovering my own faith and looking at different ways of viewing. theoretical intellectual debates about the existence of God to a large extent are no longer for me although I haven't become illogical but I
she was transferring and projecting and there's a whole mess of stuff going on and it came out that she had some doubts about whether he was going to be there for her in the long run. I, I think that's perfectly reasonable. A year two years, let's even go five years into a relationship. But if you're 25 years into a relationship and you're still worried that your spouse is going to leave you and they haven't done something to demonstrate that that's the case, that they've broken your trust, in which case, you know, you've got bigger problems than what, like what we're talking about right now. If you're 25 years in and you're getting regular signs that this person's going to bail on you. I mean, at a certain point, you win it just by longevity's sake. You know, you're just, you know, <laughs> irrespective of the signs, if you're still in it 50 years later and you haven't done anything, those signs probably only live in somebody's mind. They don't actually exist in reality. But anyway, two, three, four years in, Kay's still got these doubts. I'm okay with that. That makes sense to me. 20 years in, I'm starting to wonder what's wrong with Katie. I'm starting to wonder what she hasn't worked through. Provided, again, there hasn't been a string of infidelities and other stuff that we know is likely in the case of Ryan. <laughs> I picked you guys because I, I thought you'd be able to roll with me without getting all bent out of shape and then fighting on your way home. And so all you people I didn't pick, it's because I don't have any faith in your marriage. <laughs> Just FYI, that's what's going on. Um, so, you know, uh, you could question somebody. Uh, anyway, there's a professor. Um, I think his name is Harvey Cox at Harvard School of Divinity. He makes this argument. Um, that you could be on trial for murder and you could present all sorts of arguments for why you didn't commit a murder. And sometimes people think, well, if you're making arguments for why you didn't commit a murder, it means that you know, you, there's some doubt about whether you did or not. There's not necessarily any doubt for you about whether you committed the murder or not. You may know a hundred thousand million percent that you did not do it you may still engage in, in very elaborate argumentation if somehow or other you found yourself in a situation surrounded by a bunch of people who think you did commit a murder and therefore you have to defend yourself. And you may provide arguments, but those arguments don't necessarily entail you drinking the flavor aid, which is what Jim Jones's followers drank. They somehow got mislabeled as Kool-Aid and ruined Kool-Aid's reputation for a number of years. It was actually Flavor Aid, Kool Aid's younger brother, kind of like the generic brand, the off shelf brand of Kool Aid called Flavor Aid. That's what they all drank. You can Google it. And so you don't, you don't necessarily have, you haven't necessarily drunk the Flavor Aid just because you are making a systematic argument for why you believe in God. And just like in any other relationship, at some point, your doubts have been satisfied. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. And even more so, you have an experience of divinity beyond merely the logic of the arguments presented. And at that point, you no longer have any doubts. 
it's as natural as any other relationship with a real entity. The, the idea that it's always merely theoretical and merely logical and it merely depends on being able to win an argument is, is based on the idea that God doesn't really exist and only exists on paper and therefore it's whoever can prove something on paper. For a, an adept devotee or even an intermediate level devotee, they've experienced Krishna and they've satisfied themselves logically. And for them, there's no more doubts. So even though I started for myself, nowadays I'm a professional studier of atheists because um, it's my job to do battle with them. And I don't oftentimes, I, I live in kind of an insular situation, so I don't, I'm not oftentimes engaging with atheists on the street. There's also not really sophisticated atheists walking around on every street corner, standing on a soapbox. Um, I engage with them sometimes. Sometimes I have debates with atheists. Sometimes they're formal. Um, but to a large extent, I engage with people who have low-level atheistic tendencies, namely all of you, people like you, not every single one of you, but a bunch of you, people like you. And so I study these things so I can help other people. And then you could challenge, you could say, well, why don't you just wait till people are ready? Because that's not how it works. If you discover the cure for cancer and there's a bunch of wackos around there, we're taking horse tranquilizers instead of the cure for cancer. It's just having a bit of fun there. Um, then part of your job becomes convincing them that they should take the medicine, not just discovering the medicine. Part of your job is to convince people that they're sick, that the medicine you have is going to help them, and then you give them the medicine. In some ways, giving them the medicine is the small part of the job. The big part of the job is convincing them they need the medicine in the first place. So if you look at the life of an average Hare Krishna, a serious devotee, I'm going to go ahead and call myself a serious devotee. If you look at the life of an, of an average, typical, serious devotee, which all of you should either be or you should aspire to be, then pretty much your life purpose consists of helping other people to discover faith or develop faith. You can think about it for a minute. You can think about how important your relationship with Krishna is to you. How profound it is to you. How important it is to you. How significant it is to you. How much value it adds to your life. And then you can compare that, like Leela moonlights from her main job, uses the equipment at her main job, and then goes off and moonlights as a fancy dessert seller. And so um, you could imagine that like somebody's buying, uh, I don't know, a matcha-covered cinnamon roll from you. That's what you made this weekend, right? And or they're buying a. Uh, what else did you make this weekend? Um, ube oh, that's ube cookies, ube chocolate chip cookies. That's right. Purple cookies, green cinnamon rolls. What was the other one? Um, peanut butter jelly cookies. That's right, peanut butter and jelly cookies. Those look. I think those are my favorite. Um, You could compare the, you know, she makes the money on the weekends doing this. Has fun. It's her passion. She loves to bake. Has loved to bake since she was a kid. And now she's figured out a way to monetize it. Largely by the grace of Varungi, who steered her in the direction of some cool markets. And now she's going out there and killing it, making way more money for herself than she ever did for me. <laughs> Lila manages my restaurant, so I'm, just ha I'm having some fun with her, too. Um, and you could compare that 
to the value. That's a valuable thing. How do I know it's valuable? Because you're going out and doing it on the weekends. You're pregnant. You're working all week long. And on the weekends, you run off to some market to hang out with, with your big, not so big pregnant belly, hanging out just on, you know, just on the back side of morning sickness. And you're running out there to try and sell a few cookies. So obviously it's valuable to you, right? Just do the experiment and think about it for a minute. And think about how, what, what's more important to you? Like if you could sell a bunch of cookies, maybe $10,000 of cookies, or if you could make one person a devotee for the rest of their life. Did you follow that? Would you rather A, sell $10,000 of cookies, making yourself whatever that, you know, let's say making yourself $10,000, selling cookies in a weekend. Big numbers. And then you compare that to if you were able to change somebody's life and make them a devotee for life. Which one would be more valuable to you? I'm just assuming that for most of you, helping someone come to Krishna would trump making 10 grand. And if you've been around for a little while longer, then you probably have to admit it trumps making a hundred grand or a million dollars because how could you compare the two things? One of them is invaluable. One of them is unlimitedly valuable. And the other one is just whatever. It's the material world and you're making money. Why would you ever even insult your faith by comparing making X amount of money to what it would be like to help somebody come to Krishna? So if you are a serious devotee, irrespective of whether you're a professional devotee, whether you, your, your main job is to help people with their faith, just being a serious devotee, a real devotee, means that your primary thing you do, your primary thing you do is you create faith in people. That's the most important part of your week or your month or your year. And whatever else you're doing, like my buddy Madhu is a conscious business and lifestyle coach and ambassador of Kirtan. What's, what do you call your Kirtan thing again? I thought you had a name for your music thing that you did. Uh, we do Kirtan Academy. Kirtan Academy. I'm going to go with ambassador, musical ambassador. Because <laughs> it sounds way cooler than what you said. Sure. So he's a conscious finance and lifestyle coach. So the finance can teach people how to make money. Financial coach teaches people, people how to make money. And then lifestyle opens the door for him helping people to transform their life by being sober or vegan or believing in God or being a part of something bigger than themselves. That's the lifestyle. It's just an, it's an umbrella term that allows him to legitimize and throw in all the other stuff he gives people besides just being a financial coach. You follow? And then the lifestyle thing wasn't enough for him, so he threw the word conscious in there as an adjective to modify the whole thing. So conscious is a cool euphemism for spiritual. So now he's a spiritual finance coach, which of course is almost... It's almost uh, oxymoronic. It's almost oxymoronic to be a, a conscious finance coach. It's not exactly. It's not actually true. Just like hate is exactly the opposite of love. There's still some fire there. There's still some feeling there. And so you can be a conscious finance coach because I got one right in front of me. So, <laughs> I know that duck-billed platypuses exist because you know, I've seen them in the zoo. Um, and so there's a, <laughs> it might, you might not believe it, but I have seen it. But then the lifestyle coach allows him even more direct access to helping people uplift their lives. And so for any devotee worth their salt at an intermediate or better level, the purpose of their life 
is to bring people closer to Krishna. Because if you do the math, what compares? What could be more valuable than that? And so devotees generally have some kind of a career crisis because they don't enjoy their job, because they have such a rich extracurricular life that their job becomes a real drag. I, somebody just approached me recently and they said, let's do a jiu-jitsu bhakti retreat. And it was part of a group. There was a, a group of guys there. I don't even know them, really. But there's a group of guys. And they've all got brown belts and black belts. And so I couldn't say, no, I'm not interested, because then I would look like a wimp. So I was like, yeah, no problem. Sign me up. But they were, I think they were really asking me to organize it. Like, they want to advise me on what I should do with my free time, which was to organize a jiu-jitsu bhakti camp. And so I, in a lot of ways, I just, I just threw the ball back in their court by going, yeah, sounds great. You know, like, let me know how it goes. I'll sign up. Raghunath didn't even bother answering. He just, there's just no answer from him. Uh, and these guys watch my lectures, so they'll probably hear this. Um, so then my action I, 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 I was going to write I didn't I didn't it just, I didn't feel like it warranted it or I needed to get into it but I almost felt like writing why would I want to mix bhakti and jiu-jitsu like I do jiu-jitsu I do jiu-jitsu regularly it's part of what I do it's a hobby of mine it's, it's something that I find to be valuable but why would I want to mix that with bhakti you know, like, I don't mix boxing and deity worship. It's like, I'm like, let's go and box, and then we'll worship the deities. Like, that's something, those two things should go together for the weekend. Or let's, you know, let's make prasadam, and then we'll also, we'll also, like, we'll also, you know, do bare knuckle, like, knife fighting, you know, or something like that, right? Why, like, why, why would I mix those? They are things I'm interested in. It's true. I'm interested in those things. If, if you hang out with me, I do those things. But why would I mix those things? Why do they mix powerlifting, you know, with doing Achman or something like that? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, for people who don't have bhakti, jujitsu becomes like their religion. Their, you know, what, their hobbies become their religion, becomes the most important thing to them. But once you become a devotee, you look at the stuff and you just can't take it seriously anymore. You might have other interests or stuff that you do and stuff you have fun doing, but you can't take it seriously. I'm going to change the world through my graffiti art. He's a graffiti artist who paints murals. Is quite good. It's not just graffiti, but he, he uses spray cans. He's good. After Colby, what's his name? Colby Bryant died. Then he uh, he did a mural of Colby Bryant's face. It was like really well done. I think his hands were in there too. Really well done. His whole body was in there. And his daughter. And his daughter. Yeah, huge. You know, like twenty feet tall. You got to be really good to do a twenty foot tall mural. It's a whole nother level. But, and there was probably a time in your life when you were young where you said, I'm going to change the world. My art's going to change the world. I'm going to make it all happen. But that's not, at least my guess is, as you're now in your late 30s and you're a devotee, my guess is you love doing art. You want to do art. You want that art to have an impact. But you've accepted that what's going to change the world is bhakti, one person at a time, bringing people to bhakti, bringing yourself to bhakti, and that that trumps everything else a gazillion fold. Right? Yeah. We have such a powerful tradition, such a powerful, comprehensive and coherent philosophy that it really, if, if you let it, it changes your life and it changes everything you do and it makes, it, it reorders your entire life.
and creates a natural hierarchy of needs and a hierarchy of value. Where most of what gets people going and motivates them ceases to get you going. And you, you need to become a giver of bhakti. A receiver of bhakti and then a giver of bhakti as your main thing you do with your life. And everything else you do is just way less important. Way less important. Like I could do a bhakti retreat, and then if some of the guys we were doing the bhakti retreat with wanted to wrestle, then we could wrestle in the off time. But I would never elevate the jujitsu thing to being on par with the bhakti thing. It seems almost offensive to me. The very idea seems like a newbie idea. Now they're really going to hate me. <laughs> And if you want to give people, if you want to give people bhakti, then 80% of your job is really dealing with their atheistic tendencies. And there's, there's overt and covert atheistic tendencies. I'm, I'm co-opting these terms and defining them as I see fit for the purpose of today's discussion. But overt atheism is you actually doubt whether or not God exists. Raise your hand if you ever doubt whether or not God exists. Great. It's good. That means you're intelligent. If you haven't put five or ten years into quelling those doubts, then you don't have the right to not have any doubts about whether God exists. I think you, it requires a minimum of five to ten years of serious study and serious spiritual practice to have those doubts put to rest. And if you haven't put that time in and focused then you should naturally still have some lingering doubts. And if you have put that time in, then you should freely admit that at some point you had those doubts. And you should be able to articulate for people exactly how you dealt with them and help them to deal with them themselves. If you can't put it into words how you fixed it, you probably haven't fixed it. Your cars don't just fix themselves. So if you fixed your car, you can show other people how to fix their cars. That's another one. If you're like, I don't have any doubts, but I can't help somebody not have doubts, then there's a problem with your spirituality. You might not have the answer to every single conceivable question because there are natural limitations to people's powers of cognition and thought. And at a certain point, the conversation gets too deep and just goes beyond your, honestly, your genetic potential for, for debate and comparative ideas and, and philosophy. And then you're lucky there's people around who have the intellectual capacity for that and make it their business to learn every single argument under the sun. But at least we should all have some level of expertise. At least we should all have a considerable level of expertise and we should be able to deal with the main ones, the main doubts people have. Did you guys follow all this? So, I'm into atheism. Not anymore personally, but for other people. You're doing good, Mom. You can stay. Just keep working. And don't let your kids play with each other. That was a foolish move. That was an amateur move. Keep it together, guys. But you're doing okay. I'm able to keep my train of thought. You guys are good. But stand up if you have to and make her happy. You see, you guys have brought them in where they can see each other. So now you're looking at me. But the problem is your daughter is looking at the other girl. So move away from her so your daughter can't see the other girl. You created drama unnecessarily. It's like allowing two dogs to come and they see each other and then they start barking. But it was your fault. You should know better. And if you think it's an insult to compare a child to a dog, 
intellectually, a dog is the equivalent of a 13-month-old child. So it's actually an insult to a dog to compare your six-month-old to it. <laughs> um, you should be able to you should be able to get into it with people you should be able to get into it with people and I had a whole different class plan for the day somehow we got into this I had a whole different I had a, a verse open I was going to discuss a whole different class I had planned for today but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it. I'm going to pivot. Because I can do that. I can do that because I'm a black belt in this. And so it's easy for me to switch gears. All of you should become serious devotees. Becoming serious devotees means getting rid of your own doubts about whether God exists. The byproduct of that is you become empowered to get rid of other people's doubts. And then the majority of your job is to help people reason through their faith. The majority of your job becomes helping people to reason through their faith. To deal, like here's Naveen Madhav, one of our cooks, a friend of mine for almost 20 years now. I consider Naveen Madhav to be a serious devotee taken first and second initiation. He does service regularly at the temple. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that Krishna consciousness is the most important thing in his life. Right? And this is crazy to say to an Indian person. Bizarre thing to say to an Indian person. But Krishna consciousness, if you think about it, although it's not distinct from, if you had to compare the two, probably even more important than your family because it's forever and it's your core and it's your essence and it's your Sanatan Dharma and so even to compare it to your family in one lifetime would be an insult to Krishna because it's the most important thing ever that's ever existed in all of time in unlimited lifetimes touching divinity how could anything else compare logically or reasonably now Navi Mata has a you have a double PhD right just one, and a, and a master's in a different field, right? Yeah. He, sorry, I thought you had a double PhD. You got a master's, you worked in that field for 10 years, then you got fried, you went back to school and got a PhD. That's what you did, right? And then you switched subjects when you were getting your PhD. You were pursuing one, and then midway through, you switched because you decided you wanted to do something else. And then you opened your own firm, making electronic medical devices. What was it? making high-level, sophisticated surgical implant devices to help people see. Like, mind-blowing. And he got into that in his 30s. Already had a full career as, a, as, as an electrical engineer with a master's degree, worked in the field, and then decided, this is so important, and he went back, got a PhD, didn't like his dissertation crew, and so switched subjects and switched his dissertation team, and now has his own company making surgical implant devices to help people see right? That's a rewarding career, isn't it? Helping to give sight to the blind, I mean, it's, it's almost religious when you think about its significance to people. But even that doesn't compare to Krishna. Right? So Naveen Madhav Prabhu is a typical intermediate devotee. In his 40s, Buying a home, raising a family, putting his kid in college, making money, starting his own business, being entrepreneurial, pursuing higher education, becoming a top-notch expert in his given field. He makes great money now. Fearless about going back to school in his 30s. No one does that. They get too entrenched. Then halfway through, nobody switches PhDs halfway through. You're in the one percentile because you get too entrenched in that. Then starting his own business, 
Indians in general, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm aware there are Hindujas and Birlas in the world, but in general, when, when Indians come to the U.S., NRIs here, they, make, they get a great job, make an epic money, they invest it very, very shrewdly and wisely, and they become fabulously wealthy in their native place. And they don't generally just entrepreneurially throw it all up in the air to start their own business. But you love being your own boss and being able to guide your career, and you, you've got the nature of your wife's last name. <laughs> His wife's surname is Yudbir, which means great warrior. And so he has that same mentality, that same, I'm going to do it my way mentality, right? He's got a full life. None of it compares to Krishna. And the goal of your life is to help people come to Krishna, to participate in Krishna consciousness, to contribute to the movement, to contribute to bringing people to Krishna, right? Hey, what's the biggest dream you have in life? What's the most important thing you can do with your life? If you were to set a goal, an immediate three, five-year goal for your life, what would it be? You want to do that in three to five years? <laughs> Don't worry, Radishri. We got you. Don't worry about it. I'm just telling somebody that, uh, you want to die in three to five years. <laughs> you don't know, but that's different than I want to do it. You're like, I want to go back to God in three to five years. That means, it's not a question of I don't know. It's a saying, yes, I'm arranging for my own demise in three to five years maximum. I'm done walking this planet. Hey, what has Vedavit told us his dream in life was? Rupanugaji? No, what's he told us in private? Oh. When his brain was functioning more properly. He wants to make a Western person devotee. You've personally told me this. Do you want to do that before you die? <laughs> then that would be a goal ahead of you dying, yeah? Alright, so you die in you die in five to seven years. <laughs> Vedavid's goal is he wants to make a Western devotee. White, black, brown, he doesn't care. But he, his goal, because he makes devotees who are from India. He does that in his outreach. But he wants to make a devotee from scratch where he brings them to the temple from day one, meets them, brings them to the temple, and then is there when they get initiated. Is that your goal? What do you think about that goal, Rupa Nugaji? Brand new devotees. I'm sorry? Yeah. Help us out, Mom. Stand up. There you go. Good job. Pick her up. You can do it. And bounce. You don't have to leave. Just bounce her. Just go like this. Look, she's happy. You don't have to leave. You... All right. You can come back, but you don't have to anymore. Once you stood up, you solved the problem entirely. That's how it works. If you have a baby, stand up. I've had six babies. I stood up six times. <laughs> Each time, for years at a time. It's just part of, what, it's part of what it is. Come to church, your baby can cry, but not because you're sitting on your lazy bum and not moving around. You gotta work a little bit. Then we're cool. See how she's bouncing? She's, she's trying to have the best of both worlds. She's bouncing while she sits. And Anandani is at next level up. She has a servant. She has one chela. <laughs> and then she gives her baby to her chela, who then bounces. <laughs> Once you become an, an intermediate level devotee, the only reasonable goal for your life is to help bring people to Krishna. It must be your goal. If it's not your goal, you're still a neophyte. You're still an acolyte. You're still new. This is the goal of all intermediate and then beyond level devotees. Because they've discovered the cure for all cancer. The universal solvent. The fountain of youth. They've discovered the greatest thing that's ever existed. And the only reasonable thing to do with that that they've discovered and experienced is to then make the rest of their life giving it to others. And if you want to give it to others, 
If you want to give it to others, then the main thing you have to do is deal with their overt and covert atheistic tendencies. Overt, you actually have doubts about whether God exists, and covert, you may not have formal doubts about whether God exists, but you live in a world which is functionally atheistic, where you spend a ton of time thinking about everything in terms of you and how it involves you, and you're not part of a bigger picture. If you actually go inside someone's brain and you look at their thought process and their value system and the way they function, they function in an atheistic universe where everything depends on them, where it's all about materialism, and where it's all about what's in it for them or for their family, and they don't have a sense that they're part of something greater than themselves. Did you guys follow that? Overt and covert. One of them are just, just actual, straight-up doubts. The other one is covert tendencies. And I want to try to resolve both of those now, and even touch the verse that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, but I'm going to do my jujitsu and make the verse relevant. I just figured that one out in the last 30 seconds. So... The first thing we should do is look at the main overt, and I've got a whopping 15 minutes to do this. We should look at the main overt atheistic doubts that people have. And for today's purpose, I'm going to say there's two. If I was writing a book on the subject, I would probably spend a little more time than the one or two minutes I spent while talking, figuring out what they are. But I'm going to go with there's two main doubts. Okay? Doubt number one. There's no evidence for God's existence. Therefore, there's no reason to even entertain whether or not God exists. If you've ever dealt with an atheist before, a reasonably sophisticated atheist will say, I don't see any evidence for God's existence. You're looking at me like you think it's strange what I'm saying, Jason. I think what I'm saying, maybe you were just facing out. Cool. I'm neither. Okay. I, you were looking at me, I was like, I, I, you thought that was like a lame doubt. And I'm thinking, no, I all right, okay, good. Sometimes when you're intently listening, like you look like you've got like that. But so I, was, I thought, I was like, were you judging me? <laughs> um, it's important, epistemologically speaking, in terms of what counts as good evidence and what counts as convincing evidence, it's critical, epistemologically, to define where the burden of proof lies. And so if you want to say that we are material beings... I think the burden of proof lies with you because there is, naively, at first glance, prima facie, there is a distinction between life and matter. There seems to be an obvious distinction between myself and a chair. And if you want to say that I am nothing more than a chair with electrochemical synapses going off and consciousness is fully derivative and caused by chemical processes, then the burden of proof is on you. Because life seems to have insuperable problems that cannot be accounted for by chemistry. If you believe that biology is created by chemistry, chemistry is created by physics, then the burden of proof is on you to show how life comes from chemicals. Not how it's correlated to chemicals, but how it derives from chemicals. Because correlation does not prove causation. And when you look at things like free will and conscious thought, these are basic features that you experience every single day in your life. And there is no reasonable chemical explanation for them. At best, you find chemical correlates, but you do not find a chemical genesis for consciousness. Therefore, consciousness is evidence of spirit in this world right away. It's undoubtable. It's the least doubtable thing in existence because only by being conscious can you think about the rest of the world. It is the most innate, obvious, undoubtable feature of reality, your own consciousness. And so if you want to look for evidence of spirit in matter, why should I believe in something spiritual? Look no further than your own consciousness. And the burden of proof is on the consciousness denier on the person who tries to say that conscious is nothing more than material chemical states. Then you have to explain and show and demonstrate how you can make life from chemicals. It's called abiogenesis, which has never been done. Or at least make artificial intelligence, which also has never been done. Never close to have been done never remotely even in the ballpark of being done. And so we can, we can draw a line in the sand 
and we can say that consciousness is evidence of something spiritual existing. And we can do battle across that divide. That's our line in the sand. That's our Rubicon that we don't let people cross. Now, when you say that God exists, that gets a little more difficult because it's one thing to say, okay, I acknowledge that this consciousness is non-material, but then to jump and believe in God, well, if I don't see evidence of God, because I'm showing evidence of consciousness, and therefore if you want to say consciousness does not exist, you have to give evidence why it doesn't exist. But with God, well, the source of all consciousness, now I don't see evidence of that right in front of me. I don't see evidence of that right in front of me. And therefore, I think it's reasonable for the atheist to demand evidence for God's existence from the theist. And just like it's reasonable for us to demand evidence that consciousness is merely chemical, I think it's reasonable for an atheist to demand that we give them evidence of God's existence. Did you guys follow that? I want to be fair. I want to be fair. Sometimes there's something called reformed uh, epistemology where you simply say to somebody, I accept it as uh, a premise of my worldview that God exists. The same way you accept it as a premise of your worldview that gravity exists as a starting place and you don't bother trying to figure out where gravity came from. You accept it as a properly basic feature of reality. So I accept God's existence as a properly basic feature of reality and everybody gets to have their starting point whether it's in math, you see, the starting point is you know, like things like geometry, or whether in physics the starting point is uh, fundamental forces and fundamental particles. You accept that bosons exist. You don't ask where do they come from. They are sub-subatomic particles, and they're a basic feature of reality. And there's fundamental forces which govern them. So there's something called reformed epistemology where you try to attempt, you, you try to, attempt to make the argument that I accept God exists as a starting point. And everybody gets their starting point, and this is mine. I don't like the argument. I love the philosopher that came up with it. His name's Alvin Plantinga. He's the dean of philosophy at Notre Dame University, one of the most important theistic philosophers in the world. He was on the cover of Time magazine. But I don't like his argument. Because I feel we could do better. So, one, one way to give evidence for the existence of God is to build on the consciousness argument I just made. And understanding that the universe is moving like this, which is easily demonstrable. Easily demonstrable. The universe is moving out. You aware of this? He has a PhD in astrophysics. I was asking him, not you. <laughs> he has the PhD. It's okay. It looks like I was looking at you. I'm glad you agree with me also. But I was looking at the expert. So it's actually amazing how many learned people we have in our group. How many super smart, faithful people we have in our group. If we put together a list of the devotees in our community and their levels of expertise in various, various subjects, it's, it's, it's astounding. But anyway, you can build on the idea that the universe is expanding outwards and therefore came from a singularity. Once you accept that consciousness is an indefatigable, properly basic, fundamental feature of reality, which is not that tough to say. It's better than reformed epistemology, where you say God is that feature. You're just saying that consciousness is that, and it's easy to, to demonstrate that consciousness does have no material cause, doesn't have a compelling reason you could say where it came from materially. You haven't been able to provide any evidence you can create consciousness, or even, even intelligence, a correlate of consciousness, from purely chemical or, 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 or um, uh, through computers, um, whatever the proper term for that is, computer-generated consciousness, artificial intelligence, um, which means essentially you know, created in a computer, in a laboratory, but the laboratory being a computer. Um, it's very reasonable to say, therefore, I conclude that consciousness is properly basic. And then because we know that the universe is expanding outwards and comes from a singularity, now your singularity must also include consciousness. And a conscious singularity, a conscious source of all reality is... There you go. That's argument number one. It's, it's an evidence-based argument. There's another purely logical argument 
But the other argument I want to deal with is more aesthetic. People believe that there's suffering in the world. And because there's suffering in the world, an all-good and all-powerful God would not allow for them to be suffering. This argument is incredibly persuasive and it manifests itself in the covert lives of devotees all over the world. This one is tougher to get over for people. If you're super logical, then the first arguments might hold sway with you. But almost everybody has to contend with, irrespective of your level of intelligence, almost everybody has to deal with this. Why did God let evil exist? If you don't believe in evil, why does God let suffering exist? And who can deny that suffering exists? Well, a sophisticated Hindu will attempt to deny that suffering exists. I'll do that in a minute. But let's just, let's just go ahead and accept that suffering exists for a moment. This is another next level, next level motherhood. You get your husband to carry the baby. <laughs> Demonstrates a high level of competency. <laughs> when, your, when your servant fails, then you switch to your other servant, in this case your husband, and, and then he just sits there, doesn't move. <laughs> um, and you have, you have both mortal and natural suffering. Uh, I could, you know, attack um, Vedavit. Of course, I would never do so, but if I attack Vedavit, then you could say the source of his suffering was me. Now you could ask the question of why would God put Vedavit in a situation where he could be hurt by me? And does, could, would an all good God even allow for that to ever happen? For an innocent Vedavit to ever be put in a situation where another human being could hurt him? But even more pressing is forget I'm hurting Vedavit. How about if that baby was born and then died of a congenital heart defect? You follow? Or like my four-year-old said to me. Well, Shekhar was four years old when there was the, uh, uh, the, the tsunami off the coast of is it Fukushima. Fukushima, right? Fukushima. The tsunami. And, and, and Shekhar said to me, at the age of four, why did Krishna kill all those people in Japan? That's natural suffering. What did those people do to warrant the tsunami? Or Sri Lanka. You could have gone with Sri Lanka a year before, I believe, or a few years before. And so when you're dealing with natural evil or natural suffering, and you gotta, why would God create a child with a congenital heart defect? Maybe there were twins. One of them had a congenital heart defect. The other one didn't. One of them died. The other one lived a long life. Why wouldn't all... The all-good God showed he could create a baby without a congenital heart defect because her twin didn't have one. So then, if God had the power to do that and the goodness to do that, why did he let the other one? Why did the baby suffer? What did the baby do to warrant suffering? There's an inherent unfairness and inherent suffering which would appear to be at odds with an all-good or an all-powerful deity. Either God's weak and impotent, in which case he's not God, or he's not all-good, in which case he's also not God. You kind of have to have both features of your deity in order for you to want to worship a deity dedicate your life to a deity like we've been talking about and so you have to overcome these two hurdles God's all goodness and all power this is called the Euthyphro dilemma it goes back to Socrates it's at the dawn of western thought Socrates got into this and you pick one horn either God's all powerful but not all good or God's all good but not all powerful and if God's all good but impotent then he can't save you and if he's all if he's all powerful but not all good, he doesn't warrant your worship. But either way, you no longer have a reasonable deity that you can surrender your life to and feel protected by. And the existence of suffering, either mortal suffering for some people, but especially natural suffering, would appear to make it impossible to believe in an all good, all powerful deity. Do you guys follow this?
So obviously our explanation for this one, that most intermediate devotees will know. And if you don't know it, you're not an intermediate level devotee. If you can't answer this question, you're still a neophyte. No problem, we're going to cure you of your neophyteness today and give you the tools to succeed. But if you can't figure this one out on your own without any help, then you failed the exam. It's okay, we'll, get to, we'll do it again next week. No problem. But all of you, intermediate level devotees, should be able to easily answer this question. And our answer for this is karma. Collective and individual, spanning many lifetimes. That God is all good and all powerful, but you have free will. And you can see many cause and effects in this world. And we extend that idea of cause and effect to also include going beyond one lifetime. And therefore, if you suffer something that you didn't create in this lifetime, you may have done it in another lifetime. And sometimes a group of people get together and they do enough. And then they collectively suffer. And sometimes it looks like a small child. But that small child could have been Hitler in their last life. You don't know. And all of us are eternal. And the consequence of believing in an eternal soul and reincarnation is that we don't come into this world empty-handed. And you can trace out karma in this lifetime pretty easily. And so we can extend that understanding of karma to going beyond one lifetime. And certainly a coherent worldview. Certainly a reasonable worldview. And it now puts what seems to be natural suffering back on our plate and makes it our responsibility. And that's why karma is so critical because if we don't blame ourselves, there's no choice but to blame God. And the way you ultimately blame God is you stop believing in Him. Yeah, go outside for me. The way you ultimately blame God is you stop believing in Him. That's the ultimate way you show you have issues with divinity is you harbor doubts and either live in a functional or a formal world where you don't believe in God. Interestingly, Krishna makes an argument here, and we'll finish with this. He says, Kalolasmi loka kshai krit pravridham. I am time. Loka samahartum. I, I am time which destroys the world. And so Krishna, like many religions, Krishna here identifies himself with time, like many religions identify God with time. An indefatigable force that breaks everything down and brings everything into accord in due course. An indefatigable force that brings everything into accord in due course. That rhymed. That was smooth. So, this argument that Krishna makes in the Gita, anyway, I, there's so much in this verse and the subsequent verse I want to get into. I'm not going to. But I am going to say that what we have here is an argument for karma. Krishna is making the point that karma is actually your friend. Without some degree of suffering, we don't learn. A deity that did not leave there to be any consequences of your actions that would follow you around and chip away at you would actually not be an all-loving deity. Karma not only is congruent with an all-good deity, it's a necessity of a proper conception of God, where there's some fairness, where there's some logic. Of course, we look at the world, and we find the world follows fundamental laws like gravity and electromagnetism and strong and weak nuclear force as comprised of fundamental particles which interact with each other in reasonable and um, uh, repeatable ways. And objects on a large level interact with each other properly according to classical physics, and objects on a small level interact with each other in a, in, in, in a proper and, and a reasonable, repeatable way in quantum mechanics. And so when you look at a deity that would have created that, the singularity that would have created such a world, that singularity would also be logical and reasonable. And by looking at God's creation, you can understand something about the nature of the deity. And a world with karma where people suffered their just desserts and where people had an opportunity to learn but was never so much put in their face that they were forced to learn. That's not only congruent with an all-good God, it's a necessity. So I would argue that this world that we live in is exactly what we would expect if God was all good and all powerful. There was always the option of learning your lesson. Krishna never let you just get away and be chaotic because he's ultimately logical. And therefore there's always a re result of what you do. A lot of times you can trace it out. If you were able to trace it out in every time, you wouldn't have any free will. If you didn't forget some of your mistakes and you realize that you ended up marrying your mother from your last life and this life, or 
your parents became your children, and this, it would make free will impossible. It would be, first of all, it would drive you insane. It would take all the fun out of life. Life would be totally unsexy. There'd be no enjoyment left. You'd be relating to people that you'd known forever and in really twisted up, like inverted relationships. It would make you give up materialism automatically. You just wouldn't be able to do it anymore. You wouldn't be able, and you'd feel like there was somebody looking over your shoulder at every single moment. You wouldn't be able to get away with anything because you'd be aware that it's all going to come back to you. And you'd have evidence of that everywhere surrounding you at all times. And there'd be no free will. And so for free will to exist, which is in congruence with an all-good, all-loving deity, for free will to exist, you also have to have karma, and karma has to also include forgetfulness. And therefore, the world we live in is perfectly congruent with, not only perfectly congruent with, it, it needs to be like this. You've just been looking at it all wrong. The world's exactly as it should be. Evidence abounds. Krishna loves you so much he never forsakes you, respects you so much he never gets in the way of your free will, but loves you so much he gives you little bits and pieces if you want to pick them up and start to put the threads together. But never so much that you're forced to. Sends devotees of any tradition into your life at regular intervals to give you that clarion call and a call to action, but never so much that you lose your free will and your ability to make your own independent decisions. Consciousness here is an indefatigable, obvious, obvious piece of evidence to force you to look for something deeper. And a couple of logical steps from that, you get to a conscious deity as the singularity which gave rise to the universe. In this way, we should all become experts at the basics of theism, which means becoming expert at overcoming atheism so people can develop their faith. That is what devotees do as their life's work, whatever they're doing as a day job. And once you become a devotee, then you gotta, you gotta muster up the courage to go back out and sally forth in the material world to make ends meet, because what you really want to be doing is helping people come to Krishna. And that's exactly as it should be. And you expertly finish your affairs in the material world, and you're part-time following your heart's desire of bringing people to Krishna and as you get older you make it your full time gig of bringing people to Krishna and the making money becomes passive or part time and what a wonderful life and that's what automatically happens if you become a devotee whether you're a professional priest or not we should all be pros at this game okay that's it I went over time thank you very much Hadi Bowman